Welcome. Today I want to talk about what an API is and why it's important in web development. API stands for Application Programming Interface, and basically it's something that allows one piece of software to talk to another. Now there's lots of different kinds of APIs, but when you hear people talk about Twitter's API or Google's API, what they're talking about is a REST API. And a REST API stands for Representational State Transfer. Now, it doesn't have to be the case, but usually a REST API works pretty much the same way a website does. You make a call from a client to a server and you get data back over the HTTP protocol. Now, I think one of the best ways to show the many similarities between a REST API call and loading a normal web page can be found with Facebook's Graph API. For example, let's pull up uh, YouTube's Facebook, www.facebook.com slash YouTube. And we're all familiar with what a Facebook page looks like. It shows how many likes the YouTube page has, things like that. But now let's change the www part to graph.facebook.com slash YouTube. And what we get back is a response to our API request. We've made an API request in our browser to Facebook's Graph API. Now what we get back might appear to be gibberish to the human eye, but it's actually JavaScript object notation or JSON formatted data. It's structured data organized according to key value pairs. The same way an Excel spreadsheet is structured with key value pairs and you might ask for the data that's in cell A16, you can ask a JSON array for the data, if you want to know how many likes this Facebook page had, for the data contained under the key likes. And all modern programming languages will be able to interpret this JSON response. One more concept I want to introduce is the idea of parameters. Let's reload that same Facebook API request, but this time let's add fields equal ID, name, and likes. Now when we refresh the page, you see that only ID, name, and likes have been returned. That's because these parameters have filtered the data that we get out of this response. Now let's take a look at another API example. One that I think is really cool is provided by Google Maps and it allows you to take a city name or even an address and turn it into a set of GPS coordinates. Guys.com slash maps slash API slash geocode slash JSON. So if you remember what we just talked about, the server that we're calling is maps.googleapis.com and then the particular resource we've drilled down, it's the maps resource and then the API resource and then the geocode resource and we've even added JSON as the resource. And that's because the Google Maps API can return data in a number of different formats. And then we'll add the following parameters. We'll add address equals Chicago and sensor equals false. And as you can see, we got another JSON response. And if we look in the JSON array and we go to the key results and then the key geometry and then the key location, we see the latitude and longitude coordinates for the city of Chicago. Now that's great and all that we got the geolocation coordinates for Chicago, but what do we do with them? Well, let's mash two APIs together and take those geo coordinates over to Instagram and plug them into Instagram's media search endpoint. So in order to access the Instagram media search endpoint without having to write any code, we're gonna head over to instagram.com slash developers. And then on the left-hand side, click on API console. And we'll be able to use this API console that's provided by APIG or Apigee in order to make requests to the Instagram API without needing to write any code. And you can see if you click on the drop down on the left, there's a whole bunch of APIs that uh, this thing is set up to allow you to play with. But for now, we're gonna use Instagram and we're gonna be using the Instagram media search endpoint, which you can see is at api.instagram.com slash version one v1 slash media slash search. And then we're gonna set the following parameters. And you can see that they're added to our URL request up at the top of the screen. We're gonna set lat equal to 41.87 and longitude equal to negative 87.62. And we'll set a distance of 20 meters. And we click send and we get back this information about our request. We see it's a get request and it shows where it was sent and what parameters we passed in. Uh, one of the parameters that we didn't set was the access token because that was automatically set by the Apigee uh, interface. And then below that in sort of the blue and purple, you have key value pairs of headers that we sent as part of our request. And then if you look over at the response, you can see we got an HTTP status code of 200, which means success, that everything went okay. And then there's some header information as well. We've got uh, X rate limit limit, which is 5,000, which is the total number of requests you can make to the Instagram API using one access token during one rate limit period. And then down below, you can see X rate limit remaining, which is uh, 4,994, which is how many requests we have remaining in this rate limit window. And then there's some information about cookies and the content type, application JSON, things like that. 
And then if we scroll down, we'll see the body of the response, which is a JSON encoded array of all the images that uh, matched the geo coordinates that we passed in. And there's information such as, you know, what filter was used in order to take the Instagram picture, how many likes it receives, how many comments, information about the user who posted it, how many followers they have, things like that. And then of course, there's also the images themselves. And if we copy that image link and we take it up into our URL browser and we paste it in, then you can see there's a picture from that location in Chicago. You can even see the Chicago skyline in the background. Pretty cool, right? There's literally thousands of APIs out there that you can tap into and take their data and mash it up, pass it to another API. Chances are whatever website you wanna work with, they have some kind of API that you can use in order to consume their data. With APIs that are available, check out programmableweb.com. Up until now, we've only been consuming data from APIs, but you can also write data to APIs. But before we go down that road, we need to talk a little bit about the concept of HTTP request methods. I've linked to documentation in the description below, but the big two that you really need to know are get and post. Now, a get request is what you use to consume data, and that's what you've seen us do so far by passing these URL parameters in order to get data back from the API. But a post request, if we're writing data to the API, in the best practice is to actually put the data in the body of the request. Now, a normal web browser doesn't allow you to put data in the body of a request, but what you can do is you can install this handy extension called Postman REST Client. The nice thing about working with Postman is you can make more complex API requests. For example, you can choose any one of the available HTTP request methods, and you can see a list of them here. Second, you can add a body to your HTTP request. And finally, you can add headers. So let's use the Postman client in order to send a tweet out over the Twitter API. Before we do that though, let's talk briefly about the concept of authentication. Obviously, you need to give some kind of authentication if you're gonna be sending tweets out because otherwise you could send tweets from my Twitter account and I could send tweets from yours. And what a lot of these big online websites are using for their authentication is what's known as OAuth or OAuth2. Let me just say briefly, basically what you're doing is you're getting credentials, kind of like a username and password, although they're called a client ID and a client secret. And then you're exchanging those for what's known as an access token. And then you pass that access token to Twitter and Twitter knows that the request to make the tweet is coming from you. So it sends out the tweet from your Twitter account. Okay, so let's go ahead and send out a test tweet using the Postman REST client. We'll select post as our HTTP request method. And then you'll see that the server we're accessing is at api.twitter.com. And then as we drill down to our tweet sending resource, we got our at version 1.1 of the Twitter API, and then slash statuses slash update dot JSON. And again, that tells the Twitter API that we want JSON formatted data as a response. And we've set the authorization header to our OAuth 1.0 credentials. And then down in the body of our post request, we've set the key status to test tweet from Postman. And when we click send, you'll see that there's information about what time the tweet was created, the tweet ID that it was assigned, information about my Twitter account or the Twitter account that the tweet was sent from. And then if we click over on my timeline and we refresh the page, you'll see sure enough that the test tweet we sent out shows up.